I'm off on a trip overseas with my mistress. Sold the house for $400,000. <laughs> the overly cheerful voice of my husband, John, made me instinctively ask, What? He called from the hospital, saying he sold the house for $400,000. What does that mean? That house was precious to me, inherited from my dad. And to openly declare he has a mistress? This is madness. What are you talking about? What about Whitney if you sold the house? As soon as I mentioned our daughter's name, John scoffed. That brat. <laughs> I've always found her annoying, acting all high and mighty. Of course I'm leaving her behind. <laughs> Such words about his own daughter. I was furious and shocked to hear he sold our house and plans to flee with his mistress. I must somehow stop John. Even if he says he sold the house, it can't be transferred that quickly. I have to do something. My name is Vivian, a 39-year-old housewife. I wish I could say I live happily with my husband John, a year older than me and our nine-year-old daughter, Whitney. But our relationship with John is far from harmonious. Since our marriage, John's personality has gradually twisted, and I've been suspecting his infidelity for a year now. Without proof, I've been unable to act, and John doesn't seem to hide his cheating. John works at a factory for a parts manufacturer, and goes out drinking four or five nights a week after work. It's possible he goes out with work colleagues, but he didn't go out this often until a year ago. Moreover, John comes home smelling of unique perfumes and preparing luxury bags and shoes I've never seen as gifts. Of course, he never gives them to me, often leaving the house with them. I'm too scared to confront him about his infidelity cowardly waiting for concrete evidence. He's a different person from the John I met. We met ten years ago, dated for a year, and then got married. I was drawn to his kindness and gentlemanly manner, and before I knew it, I was in love. We got engaged on our first anniversary and married, with Whitney born soon after. It seemed like a happy marriage from the outside. But why has it come to this? It all started when Whitney turned one. As Whitney turned one and became more active than ever, rummaging around the house, parenting became increasingly challenging. As a housewife, I was with Whitney all day long. But sometimes it was too much for me alone. And I started asking John, after work, to help with baths and meals. Initially, perhaps due to a sense of paternal duty, John helped as I asked, but as the days went on, he seemed to grow resentful and stopped engaging in childcare. I've been thinking, isn't this your job? You're the housewife, so you should be able to handle childcare alone. <laughs> Why should I, tired from work, have to help? <laughs> John's frustration exploded with those harsh words, and after throwing them at me, he left Whitney and me in the living room, quickly retreating to the bedroom alone. I tried to calm Whitney, now in the terrible twos, and throwing tantrums, even over getting into pajamas, while John's words painfully stabbed my heart. Afterward, John completely disengaged from Whitney. Even on his days off, when Whitney asked, Daddy, let's play. John would respond, Playing is mommy's job. <laughs> I'm busy. While reading a magazine, he never tried to understand Whitney's feelings. When Whitney cried, he would snap, Hey, don't cry over this. What kind of parenting is Vivian doing? <laughs> a housewife who can't even handle childcare? How incompetent. <laughs> glaring at both Whitney and me. I didn't want Whitney to hear John's verbal abuse, so we retreated to our room, forced to play together. 
There were times I wanted to enjoy my hobbies, like reading or watching movies, but living constantly with Whitney left me with virtually no personal time. Yet John enjoyed his hobbies while I endured his verbal abuse. It was so unfair. However, our household depended on John's income, so I couldn't complain. Without John, I couldn't provide for Whitney alone. I was angry at my own helplessness. So, John lived carelessly, indifferent to parenting. Eight years have passed since then, and Whitney is now nine. John's verbal abuse continues, unabated, and the kind John I knew before our marriage is nowhere to be seen. I lived with John solely to support Whitney, avoiding provoking him as much as possible. Mom, you're so good at drawing. You should do it as a job. One day, while drawing together, Whitney suddenly said that. Do art as a job? Yeah, your drawings are so kind and wonderful. Whitney smiled brightly, looking at the animal illustrations I had drawn. I've always loved drawing, and even once aspired to be a manga artist. Although I realized halfway that it was impossible and gave up, I still drew illustrations as a hobby. I always show your drawings to my friends and brag about them. They all say they're amazing. I'm envious of you being able to draw like that, Mom. Despite having a twisted dad like John, Whitney grew up honest and straightforward. She's cheerful, the complete opposite of my introverted self. She seems to have many friends at school and is favored by her teacher. I felt so proud when Whitney complimented my painting. Knowing Whitney was watching me gave me confidence. Thank you. I'm so happy. When I said that, Whitney's smile bloomed like a flower. If Whitney can smile, I feel like I can keep going in this life. I quietly thought to myself. That night, John came home drunk as usual, stumbling into the living room as soon as he arrived. He was completely intoxicated. His drinking had been getting worse lately, to the point of concern. Sighing. <sighs> I peeled off his jacket and checked his pockets. What's this? Usually there's nothing but keys in his pockets, but this time a piece of paper caught my eye. It was a receipt with what seemed to be a hotel's name on it. This is definitely proof of cheating. I had suspected his infidelity, but now I had physical evidence. Trying to calm my fluttering heart, I carefully tucked the receipt away on the shelf. I started thinking about how to confront John. The next day, still half drunk, John left the house. After Whitney went to school, I did the usual household chores, but I couldn't stop thinking about the receipt. I had suspected John's cheating, and not confronting him was my choice. But now, with solid evidence, it's hard to continue this false marriage. Within a week, or maybe even a few days, I want to make him admit his affair and apologize. How should I? As I was thinking... My mobile phone vibrated. Who could it be at this time? It's rare to get a call during the day. Checking the phone, it was an unknown number. A sense of foreboding, I answered. Hello, is this Mrs. John Simmons? Yes, speaking. Who's this? This is North Hospital. Mr. Simmons has been. The call was from the largest general hospital around. The hospital informed me that John had been brought in by ambulance, undergoing surgery for a kidney disease. They also said that his kidney is likely to fail and will need a transplant. Confused by this sudden news, the doctor asked if I was okay. Yes, um, a kidney transplant is possible, right? Yes, we'll start looking for a donor. And if we find a match, we can proceed with the transplant surgery. 
Although my mind was in chaos, hearing that John needed a kidney transplant, the doctor continued to explain about the surgery. We'll check the compatibility with potential donors, so please cooperate. I only half understood what the doctor was saying, but I knew John was seriously ill. Despite John belittling me and having affairs, I don't wish him dead. I hope he can be saved. That day, I spent the whole night thinking about John's transplant surgery. Weeks passed, and we found out the compatibility results for potential kidney donors, primarily within the family. Surprisingly, I was the best match. John's parents are alive, but in poor health, unable to undergo such a surgery. Being an only child and the healthiest, I, with the same blood type as John, was the best choice. It would be a lie to say I had no doubts. But John's life is irreplaceable. With that thought, I decided to be the donor for John's kidney transplant. When I explained John's condition and our transplant surgery to Whitney, Got it. Take care. She cheerfully said. During my hospitalization, Whitney would stay with John's parents. They're in poor health, but capable enough to care for themselves at home. Whitney, close with her grandparents, was happy to go to Grandpa and Grandma's house. This should be fine for a while. It was a relief that Whitney is such a well-behaved child. With that assurance, I went through with the transplant surgery. A week later, after signing the consent form and undergoing health checks, I underwent the kidney transplant for John. The surgery was quicker than I expected, and I stayed in the hospital for about a week, John for 10 days. Fortunately, there were no complications, and our recovery was smooth. The day before my discharge, my mobile phone rang again. Wondering who it could be this time, I answered. It's me. A familiar voice said suddenly, startling me. It was John. Thinking he might be thanking me for being a donor, I asked. It's been a while. How are you feeling after the surgery? I expected him to say something like, I'm better thanks to you, Vivian. Thank you. But his reply was unexpected. About our house. John paused and then continued. Suddenly, he brought up the topic of the house, and I was thrown into disarray. I sold it for $400,000, and I'm going on a trip abroad with my mistress, Alexandra. <laughs> His voice was inappropriately cheerful, and I instinctively asked, What? He called from the hospital to say, I sold the house for $400,000. What does that mean? That house was precious to me, inherited from my dad. And to openly declare he has a mistress? This is madness. What are you talking about? What about Whitney if you sold the house? As soon as I mentioned our daughter's name, John scoffed. That brat. <laughs> I've always found her annoying, acting all high and mighty. Of course I'm leaving her behind. <laughs> what a way to talk about his own daughter. I was furious and shocked to hear he sold our house and plans to flee with his mistress, Alexandra. I must, somehow, stop John. Even if he says he sold the house, it can't be transferred that quickly. I have to do something. After John said, I sold the house, going on an overseas trip with Alexandra, the phone call abruptly ended. Confused, I tried to make sense of what had happened. But no matter how much I thought about it, I just couldn't believe he sold the house suddenly, especially while I was in the hospital. Shocked, my condition worsened, and my hospital stay was extended by a few days. In my despair, I lay in bed alone, helplessly pondering the future. First, I should call Whitney. Without the house, Whitney and I have nowhere to return. It was infuriating enough that John boldly declared he has a mistress. 
that my primary concern was Whitney. I called my in-law's house, and my mother-in-law Yasmin answered. She quickly handed the phone to Whitney. Hello, Whitney. I'm sorry. It looks like Mom's hospital stay got extended. Are you okay? Not too lonely. Also, I heard Dad sold the house. We have nowhere to go back to, right? Worried, I bombarded her with questions. Then, Whitney replied cheerfully. Mom, it's okay. I've taken care of it. Taken care of it? Confused by her words, I was puzzled. Dad said he asked his mistress to sell the house. But actually, Grandpa and Grandma... Whitney detailed the events that had transpired during my hospitalization. I was stunned by the unexpected turn of events that had unfolded without my knowledge. So, Mom, rest easy, I'm fine. Thank you. Encouraged by Whitney's responsible words, I was finally able to calm down a bit. But if Whitney's story was true, what had become of John and Alexandra by now? Curious, I reminded myself that the rest was crucial, and drifted off to sleep. Three days later, fully recovered, I was discharged and headed to my in-law's house. Mom, welcome back. Whitney ran up to me with a joyful face. Yasmin was smiling behind her. I'm glad for you. And John, he really did something unbelievable. I'm sorry, Vivian. My father-in-law, Kevin, apologized with a grim face. Despite having such wonderful parents, how did John end up so twisted? No, it's my fault for following along without saying anything. Please don't apologize. Thank you. And, well, Vivian, there's something we need to tell you. Yes, what is it? I sat down with Kevin and Yasmin, listening to their story with Whitney by my side. Though surprised again by their news, Yasmin's firm encouragement, We won't let John have his way, reassured me. After hearing from Kevin and Yasmin, I was about to head home with Whitney. When passing a real estate agency, I noticed a familiar man and an unfamiliar woman arguing with an agent. It was unmistakably John, and the woman with him must be Alexandra. John was in a tracksuit with messy hair, and Alexandra wore a short skirt with only one high heel, no makeup. Hey, what do you mean the house can't be sold? Yeah, what about my $400,000? Well, the buyer canceled the purchase last night, so the contract is no longer valid. Huh? Why cancel? Damn it. Seeing John stamping his feet and Alexandra shrieking at his side, Passers-by turned their gaze in surprise. Whitney and I were also shocked, but realizing it was about us, we approached them. What are you doing here? Startled by my sudden voice, Alexandra let out a ridiculous, Huh? Upon recognizing me, What are you doing here? Ah, I get it. You're behind this, aren't you? You must have convinced the buyer not to go through with it. Huh? This is unbelievable. What are you even talking about? As John and Alexandra hurled insults, I suddenly moved Whitney behind me to protect her. Confused, the real estate agent listened as I introduced myself as his wife. The agent responded with a bewildered, Uh, are you kidding me about the cancellation? Because of you, we had to turn back right before boarding the plane. And now we can't buy a new house. I even have debts from the money I spent on her. John pointed at his mistress as he said her. I see. Finally, I understood John's intentions. John had tried to sell the house, which I had inherited from my late father, to pay off debts incurred from his spending on Alexandra, and to buy a new place for them to live. Such selfishness. Ignoring Whitney and me, he even tried to take away my most valuable asset. I was shaking with anger. Excuse me, but aren't you the one being disrespectful? Coming out of nowhere and talking back to me? 
as if you could survive without me. Despite the dire situation, John's continued insults were appalling. First off, did you really think you could sell my precious house without discussing it with me? I'm the owner. Did you forge the documents or something? And you've been bad-mouthing the home buyer. But that buyer was your own parents. Huh? What do you mean? Indeed, what Whitney had told me on the phone while I was hospitalized was that Kevin and Yasmin had pretended to buy my house as a plan to teach John a lesson. Having heard everything about John's misdeeds from Whitney, they were furious, saying, How could he do this to Vivian and our sweet granddaughter? Whitney's bright and honest nature had made her grandparents believe her over their son. Let me explain. Grandpa and Grandma got really mad when they found out about Dad and that woman. I knew Dad was trying to sell the house, so I talked to them. They said they wouldn't let it be sold so easily, since it's a special house Dad left for Mom. So before someone else bought it, they intentionally made a bid to buy it. Whitney stepped forward and boldly explained the situation. Those guys. My own parents doing this to me? Old parents. And you two, acting all high and mighty? Just kids. Shows how badly Mom raised you. <laughs> John sneered crudely. Undeterred by John's attack, Whitney stood firm. I pulled out a piece of paper from my bag and thrust it in front of John's nose. Sorry, but we're getting divorced. John laughed through his nose at the sight of the divorce papers. <laughs> divorce? You said it, right? You okay with divorcing? You think you can survive without me? John must think that as a housewife, I'll be lost if we divorce. Indeed, that might have been the case before. But now, I had a secret plan. To shatter John's shallow thinking, I spoke up. Don't worry. I received a gift from your parents while they're still alive. Huh? A living gift? What's that? John and his mistress looked bewildered. This morning, Kevin and Yasmin told me they wanted to give me part of their assets while they were still alive. Their health was failing, and they weren't sure how much longer they had. Of course, I initially refused, suggesting they should give it to John. But Kevin and Yasmin insisted, We value you, Vivian, who gave us a lovely granddaughter. More than a son who can't even thank her for donating an organ. I expressed my gratitude and agreed to accept their living gift. It's your dad and mom's wish. They said they wanted to give it to me, not you. John's face turned pale. Understandably so. He was losing the assets that should have been his to a wife he was divorcing. That's dirty. That's not right. It's normal for children to inherit their parents' assets. I'll talk to them now. If they won't listen, I'll take it to court. John glared at me with fiery eyes, shouting. <sighs> I sighed at John's endlessly shallow thoughts. Maybe it's time to deliver the final blow. Stepping forward, I locked eyes with John and declared, You're talking nonsense. It all started with you belittling me, and even having a mistress, right? You're the one who spent the money. Kevin and Yasmin's decision is only natural. And do you even have the money to sue? Even if you did, how would your betrayals play out in court? A scream escaped John's lips. He trembled at the sight of me, now looking like a demon. Sorry, I won't sue. Please forgive me. His apology was desperate, but it was too late. I glared at John once more and delivered my final words. I'll make sure you pay for insulting Whitney and me. Alimony and child support. All of it. If you can't pay, I'll chase you to the depths of hell. Be prepared. John and Alexandra screamed and ran away. The real estate agent who had witnessed everything... Thank you, he said with relieved posture. No, I'm the one who should apologize for causing you trouble. 
With those words, I quickly left with Whitney, heading back home. Mom, you are so cool. Thank you, Whitney, for fighting for Mom. Despite the situation, Whitney's face was lit with a smile. I vowed in my heart to protect her for a lifetime. A few days later, I was able to successfully divorce John. It felt surreal that my long-endured marriage ended so easily with just a piece of paper. I wondered why I had tolerated it all for so long. John, having squandered his money on Alexandra, had to take out a loan to pay the alimony. Alexandra left him saying, I can't be with such a poor man anymore. To add to his misfortune, John's company faced a sales decline due to material shortages and had to cut labor costs. Working in the factory, John was one of the first to be laid off. It's unfortunate, but I can't help but think there was a reason for his layoff. Probably, those with poor performance and behavior were the first to go. John, who acted arrogantly at home, must have behaved similarly with his subordinates at work. Now, having lost his job, wife, and lover, John is barely making ends meet with part-time work. Without the energy to job hunt, he's settling for part-time jobs that allow him to work and rest at his leisure, probably leading to a bleak life. But I couldn't muster any sympathy for him. I gave John a part of my kidney and did everything I could. Yet he ridiculed me, and it seems like karma has caught up with him. He can sweat it out just to pay off his debts. As for me, I started working on illustrations, inspired by Whitney's compliment about my drawing skills. While the orders are still few, my customers praise my work as meticulous and skilled. I'm determined to increase my clientele and provide a good life for Whitney.